Uh, I just want to start by introducing myself. If you don't know me, my name is Brian Ottinger. Um, in some ways, I consider this my home church. Um, the Lord saved me in 2010, and the most formative years of my Christian walk were at this church um, by way of just drilling in the importance of the scripture, community, discipleship, evangelism, all, all the most important things, uh, most importantly, Jesus. And so I just want to just stay, start by saying how much I love you guys. I'm very grateful for all the leadership. Pastor Joey was the first pastor I ever saw in my life who uh, really showed me what a pastor was supposed to look like. And it was because of his influence in my life that I I decided to go into ministry as well. So I just want to start by saying thank you. I know he's not here, but I do love Pastor Joey. I love Sean, uh, all you guys. Just great seeing your faces. Um, So many faithful people serving the Lord so faithfully. And to see all these kids now sprouting out. It's really cool. Um, Also, the last time I was here, um, I was actually preaching my mom's funeral from this this pulpit. So I really appreciate uh, the leadership and the congregation allowing, uh, you know, my family to use uh, this sanctuary to hold the funeral here. Uh, That was a very hard day. And uh, special shout out to Ben Humphrey. I don't know where he's at, but he he came and served. Uh, he'd probably get mad at me saying this. I tried to bless him with a gift. He refused. He said it was an honor for him to come in and do slides that day, and that meant a lot to me. So I just wanted to start by saying thank you and showing my gratitude and honor for, for this body. So thank you. Um, before we get into the text today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a picture on the screen, or actually Claire's going to put a picture on the screen, because I realized if I talked about this, you might not know what Where's Waldo is, all the old people, y'all, everybody, okay, uh, some younger people. Um, this is a, a book that was popular when I was a kid, and basically, um, there's a guy named Waldo, he wears a floppy hat, a red and white striped shirt, he has glasses, and the idea is that Waldo is somewhere in this picture, and you have to find him, and so... We're not going to do that right now because it might take a while, and I don't even know where he is, to be honest with you. He's somewhere in there. Um, but anyways, this is what, this is, this is the Where's Waldo concept. You look for Waldo. And um, a lot of times you get distracted by the things that look like Waldo, right? There's a lot of red and white striped things. Uh, there's a lot of people that resemble his appearance. But there's only one Waldo in the picture. And um, sometimes for me, it felt like I was, it would take me hours to find him. And then by the time I finally found him, I became very frustrated because I realized he was right there the whole time. Once I found him, I would think to myself, how did I miss it? He was right there. And in today's passage, we're going to look at the disciples' life in Mark chapter 8 and see the very sort of same concept, is they had everything they were looking for right in front of their own eyes, but they missed it. They had Jesus, God in the flesh, right there in the boat with them in this chapter, in this passage, um, in this chapter, this passage will read that uh, they had just got done experiencing Jesus feeding the 4,000, this miraculous thing where Jesus had multiplied bread and fish and fed 4,000 people. He did it previously through the 5,000. And as they're in the boat holding a loaf of bread that Jesus likely multiplied from other loaves, they were focused on the fact that they only had one loaf of bread instead of the fact that they had Jesus in the boat, the one who could multiply the bread. They were focused on what they didn't have instead of who they had. And I think this, this is a relevant message for them and for us and probably until we die because we all easily fall into that category of self-reliance or self-dependence instead of trusting in God over self. So the title of this sermon is Beware the Leaven, Trusting in God over self, and we're going to be reading primarily from Mark chapter 8, verses 14 through 21. And uh, Claire, do we have the scripture? Okay, I'd like for us to stand together and honor the reading of God's word, and then we'll jump into the sermon. So I'm going to read, and you guys can uh, feel free uh, to read along with me. Mark chapter 8, verses 14 through 21. Let me know if you need some extra time to get there. If you're there, say word. All right, that's most of y'all. All right, starting off in verse 14. Let me put on my glasses. 
All right, verse 14. Now they had forgotten to bring bread. You guys read with me. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? Let's pray. Father, we need your help to see and understand your word. And so I pray, God, that your spirit would take the revealed word and reveal it to our hearts, that we might uh, be changed, that we might grow in our sanctification. God, those of us that know you would, would come into a deeper reliance upon you alone. And Lord, if there's anyone here who is yet to fully trust in you, they've yet to fully surrender their life to you, God, that uh, through this sermon and through this time, God, through this service, through your spirit, that you would bring them from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can be seated. So, <clears throat> the way the um, sermon points are going to be broken down, it's going to be the first three points are going to be primarily focused on the warnings about the leaven and of self-dependence, and verses are points four through six will uh, be designed to help you understand how to overcome your self-dependence to be more reliant upon God. So point number one is the leaven's influence, the subtle spread of self-dependence. How many of you guys um, make sourdough or do bread in here? Just my wife. Okay, a couple of the other guys. Um, there's a thing called a starter that you use, and, and basically it's sort of like leaven. What it does, it helps, it helps the whole loaf grow, right? Am I right? So I don't do it. My wife does it. I, th I eat it. It's really good, but, but she's the one that does it. And so leaven's a similar principle. Leaven is, is used uh, in bread to make, make the bread grow. And what Jesus is warning them against here um, is that the self-dependence that, that they had could essentially grow into all kinds of other sins. In verses 14 through 16, he says this. Now they had forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they'd been, they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. In this passage, the disciples find themselves concerned about having only one loaf of bread. Jesus takes this opportunity to caution them about the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. So what is the leaven of the Pharisees? The leaven of the, of the Pharisees refers to the hypocrisy or the self-righteousness of these religious leaders called the Pharisees. A reliance on religious acts to earn favor from God. The Pharisees appeared righteous outwardly, but yet their hearts were far from God. Their pride, legalism, and unbelief spread like leaven, influencing others to focus on outward appearances rather than true faith in God alone. The leaven of Herod represents worldliness, political power, and compromise. Speaking of the political six systems and elections, King Herod's focus was on gaining and maintaining power. His decisions were driven by fear of men rather than a fear of God. His leaven, too, was capable of corrupting the hearts of those who followed him, pulling, the way, pulling them away from trusting in God. Jesus' warning here is clear. Even a small amount of these attitudes can infiltrate and spread throughout our lives, leading us away from depending on God and leaning us towards self-reliance. Whether that self-reliance is in the form of religious pride, like the Pharisees, or in worldly pursuits like Herod. In Genesis chapter 16, we see a great example, uh, one of the first examples in Scripture of Trusting in self rather than God. In Genesis chapter 16, God promised Abraham and his wife Sarah that they would have a son 
But as time went on and Sarah remained childless, they became impatient. Instead of waiting for God's promises to come true, Abraham and Sarah took matters into their own hands. Sarah suggested that Abraham take for himself their handmaid, Hagar, to have a son with. This decision reflected self-reliance rather than trusting in God. Instead of waiting on God's timing, they acted on their own understanding, which inevitably led to a long-term conflict we see throughout the history of the world, as we see even Islam as being a descendant of the children of Hagar. This illustrates how doubt and impatience can lead us away from dependence on God, much like the influence subtly of leaven. We must, as God's people, resist the urge to take control of things when they aren't happening in our time. Let us learn from Abraham and Sarah's mistake and choose to fully trust in God's promises. Even when waiting is difficult, Jesus wanted his disciples and for us to recognize that a small amount of doubt or impatience can lead us away from trusting in him. One way I see this manifest in my life, and I see it manifest in the life of the church, is through agitation. So a question I want to ask you is, what agitates you? What agitates you? A lot of times, righteous Christian people who are seeking after the Lord can turn unrighteous when they become agitated because they want a good thing or a God thing, but it doesn't happen on their timing, and they start to take matters into their own hands. Um, I'm certainly very guilty of this myself. Um, the Bible says not to be hasty in anything, but in everything through faith. So what agitates you today? Where do you struggle? It's likely that most of your agitation comes from um, some sort of self-reliance or depending on yourself rather than trusting on the Lord. Um, I'd be a little a missed if I didn't mention that from this pulpit back in June, um, I was able to give the eulogy for my mom's funeral. And my mom was a person who um, didn't live a life that was pleasing to the Lord. She wasn't a Christian for the majority of her life, like 99.9% .9 of it. And in her last days, um, through dementia and Alzheimer's and, and other things, as her mind started to shatter, um, she became more like a child, and she became harder to minister to. We prayed for her for over the years, many years. Uh, she actually was in this, uh, this sanctuary when I was ordained as a deacon here, and some of you may remember her, but um, basically at the end of her life, um, she, she reached a point where we couldn't really even talk to her. And so by God's grace, um, one of the last moments we had with her um, was us at the nursing home in Burnsville and we were doing everything we could to minister to her. My family and I uh, sat around her in a wheelchair and we sang songs, we prayed, we weeped. Um, it was difficult. And in the final you know, hours of her life, she, she called out to the Lord and she, she uttered words I never thought I'd hear her say, you know, calling on, on Jesus and, you know, I don't even understand, I don't understand, like, what happened or even the words. It was all surreal. But um, in some way, God's faithfulness was manifest to my mom in her last days. And then about two months after that, my wife and I were able to um, sit by my mom's bedside. And if you've ever sat by someone's bedside as they slip into eternity, it is a, a supernatural experience. And... Um, I, the peace of God, which surpassed all understanding, was with us. We were, we were praying for her. We were ministering to her. And she took her last breath, and she entered into the presence of God. And it was, it was amazing. I mean, it was, it was probably one of the highlights of my life, as bad as it was. And um, I just want to encourage you, don't grow weary in waiting on the Lord. You know, I, I wish I could tell you I, that... I was faithful to pray for her every day, and I continued to minister to her and for her. I didn't. I failed in many ways, but God didn't. And God won't fail you. Don't give up. Don't give up. The second thing that uh, I want to highlight in Scripture here is that uh, Jesus asked him this question in, in verse 17 and 18. He's, 
He's aware of their condition. He's aware of their, their unbelief. And he says, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? And I want to tell you that the, the danger of dis- dismissing dependence on God can start from a hardened heart. And a lot of times when we think of hardened hearts, we think about Pharaoh, whose heart was hardened. But how many of you guys know that Christians can become dull to the things of God? Christians can become hardened to the things of God. And even though disciples had Jesus in the boat with them, and they just witnessed a miraculous miracle, their hearts became hardened uh, to the fact that Jesus was in the boat. Jesus rebukes them in love for their lack of understanding. They had just witnessed the miracles he performed, feeding thousands off only a few loaves. Yet here they were worrying about their own provision. Their anxiety, even though while Jesus was present, showed that their hearts were hardened towards him. They were struggling to trust him fully, despite all that they had seen him do. A hardened heart struggles to perceive God's provision. A hardened heart struggles to see God's presence. A hardened heart will help you struggle to see his power in your life. It is a heart that defaults to self-reliance rather than trusting in the sufficiency of God. 1 Samuel 13, we see King Saul facing a crisis. The Philistine army was encroaching, preparing to attack And Samuel had instructed Saul to wait for seven days for him to come, offer a burnt offering before the battle. This offering was was meant to show dependence on God. But when Samuel didn't arrive at the expected time, Saul grew impatient and decided to take matters into his own hands. His troops were scattering. He panicked. Instead of waiting, Saul offered up the sacrifice himself, something only the prophet was allowed to do. And when Samuel finally arrived, he rebuked Saul, saying, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Three key lessons I want to highlight from Saul's actions in this. The first is that he had a lack of trust in God. Saul's actions showed that he did not trust God's timing or provision. His fear led him to act in his own strength rather than waiting on God. Similarly, the disciples in Mark 8 were anxious about the lack of bread, even though they had Jesus, the ultimate provider, with them. The second thing is his hardened heart towards God's commands. Saul's impatience revealed a hardened heart. He dismissed the importance of obedience to God, choosing instead to rely on his own understanding. This is exactly what Jesus was pointing out to his disciples as well. They were focused on their physical lack instead of God's sufficiency. And thirdly, his impatience and self-reliance. Saul's impatience led him to overstep his role. Instead of humbling himself and waiting on God's provision through Samuel, he acted in his own strength. This hardened his heart further and led to God rejecting his kingship. In the same way, the disciples focused on what they lacked rather than who they had with them was a sign of self-reliance and a hardened heart. I want us to reflect on this for a moment here. We often, too, are like Saul in that we are unwilling to wait on God and we take matters into our own hands. This is often a sign that our hearts become hardened. Our hearts become um, not trusting. And the cure for this is to remember God's faithfulness and trust his timing is always best. Let us learn from Saul's mistake and the disciples' struggle to see Jesus' sufficiency and instead keep our hearts soft and fully reliant on him. Which leads me to the third point. In Mark 8, 19 through 21, Jesus said, Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven... For the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not understand? Like, if you you were to go back and read Mark 8, like, literally the way Mark's written, it's like event after event after event. It's it's beautiful. I love it because it's like things just keep moving. And right before this, Jesus literally feeds 4,000 people with a few loaves. Like, it just happened. 
And the Pharisees come and, and they want Jesus to perform another sign. And Jesus is like, he's deeply grieved. It says, basically, we always like to think of God as a really patient God. And he is very patient. But in this moment with the Pharisees, he's like, I'm done. Like, I'm done being patient. And, and they went in their boat. And, and then in this moment, right after this great feeding, this great miraculous thing, we see the disciples also not trusting. They had just forgotten. Jesus has proven to them time and time again that he would provide for them abundantly, and yet they are still focused on their lack. Their forgetfulness led to anxiety as they were immediately focused on their problem instead of the solution. Again, they were focused on their lack of bread versus the one who could multiply the bread. They forgot about the power of the one who was with them. They forgot about his faithfulness and instead started to become self-reliant. Where will we get more bread? When, we're, when we forget what God has done for us, we fall in these same sort of patterns, don't we? It's weird because, like, I wish I had a loaf of bread with me to, like, just to visualize, right? They were holding, likely, a loaf of bread that had been multiplied. They were holding it. And you would think, we, we kind of like look at those guys like, what's wrong with those guys? Like, they're forgetting. But every time we sin, every time that we, we trust in our own, we're doing the same thing. We do the same stuff. And I want to speak, um, speaking of bread, I want to share a story of probably one of my heroes of the faith. Any of y'all ever heard of George Mueller? A couple of you guys. George Mueller is an amazing Christian evangelist. Um, God used him to create one of the largest orphanage movements in the history of the world. He famously operated three orphanages without ever asking for, for financial support from anyone but God. He chose to rely on God through prayer. He had a prayer journal, and um, he would write his prayers down in the, the prayer journal, and then he would circle them every time God answered him. And he, he has this prayer journal you can look at. And I'm not against like fundraising and stuff. Actually, love life. We have to do that so we can raise up missionaries across the U.S. to stand for the preborn. But this guy is a model. He's an example of a guy who just fully trusted in God. So much so, there's a remarkable story that involves Mueller and some of his orphans and his family sitting around an empty table, praying for the food that they were about to receive. When all of a sudden, they got a knock on their door. And there was a bread truck that broke down right outside the orphanage. And the driver offered the bread to Mueller because it would have gone bad otherwise. Like this is the kind of faith that man had. This story beautifully illustrates what it means to completely rely upon God. Even though he didn't have, he was thanking God for the bread he was about to receive. And like the disciples, we're holding the bread that God has given us, worried about where the next piece is going to come from. I want to encourage each one of you, whether young or old, to in this moment think on a time when God has shown up and does something for you that only God could do. There was a time in your life where you needed God to do something that only he could do and he came through for you. And I want to encourage you, hold on to that thing. I don't have any tattoos, but if I did, I would get tattoos of things that remind me of the faithfulness of God, whether it's scriptures he's used to bring me through situations, whether it's pictures of my family, whether it's moments in time, whatever it may be, however you need to remember, take pictures, put them on the wall of your house. I got a picture in my office of the very first time I met my wife. And its frame has little stones around it. It's my stone of remembrance to remind me what God has brought me through. A life of sin, a life of rebellion, a life of just absolute selfishness to a now living a life that is not perfectly but submitted to God. And God has done amazing things in my life. I know each one of you have stories upon stories upon stories of how God has been faithful. And yet... When the next need comes and you start to feel agitation or anxiety, it's a sign that in you, you're not remembering the goodness of God. 
And so if you're anxious today, I want to encourage you. Stop. You have nothing to be anxious for. It's a command in Scripture. Be anxious for nothing. But in all things, pray to the one who will supply all your needs. Amen? God can handle whatever whatever, whatever nonsense you're holding on to, whatever big or small thing, whatever, whatever it is. I don't want to make light of it, but listen, God can handle it. God can answer it, and God will answer it in his timing according to his ways. So let us grow. Let us be habitual. I remember, uh, I don't know if they still have the room here. Hopefully I don't get anybody in trouble. Uh, when we first became members, there was a room over here where it had um, like church history. Is that still there? You know what I'm talking about? This room right here, it's not there anymore? Huh? Library. Was it, but there was pictures on the wall of like, old pastors and stories and one of the things that I remembered about this church was that the fellowship hall was built through chicken and dumplings like I love chicken and dumplings and there's chicken and dumplings here right Miss Terry Lynn we got some chicken and dumplings we're going to today every time I eat chicken and dumplings it reminds me of God's faithfulness to this church right I don't know all the history of this church I know the history of, of, of our time here I know what God did that's why I started this sermon with just honoring you guys' impact on our lives. It's been instrumental. You know, a lot of times we have short-sighted history. We, we remember the bad things or we don't remember any good thing. It's like, that's just part of our life. We're on to the next thing. We need to remember God's faithfulness. Like back in the day, people used to walk to church here and they said it would be good for us to have a meeting place where we can have meals after the service and then, you know, Chicken and dumplings. Wasn't that the thing? Am I, am I misspeaking? Wasn't it like chicken dumpling fundraisers? There was, there was these fundraisers, and that's how you built the, 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 the uh, fellowship hall. And maybe that's not even a true story. But it sounds good. I love chicken dumplings. Huh? Yeah, even Terry Lynn's like, we need to show Does anyone remember? Anyways, Sorry. You can make stuff up, but, but, but there's also good stuff that's not made up. Like, remember the good stuff. Celebrate it. So these next couple of points I'm going to move through pretty quickly. These are, these are sort of the solutions. These are some of the ways God teaches us to be more upon, reliant upon him than others. In the next chapter over, um, in Mark chapter 9, 33 through 37, Jesus shows us a great example of humility and a practical path to fight against self-dependence it says when they came to Capernaum and when he was in the house he asked them what were you discussing on the way but they kept silent for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest and he sat down and called the 12 and he said to them if anyone would be first he must be last of all and servant of all and he took a child and he put him in the midst of them and taking him in his arms he said to them Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. The disciples in this passage were caught arguing about which one of them was the greatest. The argument showed that they were still thinking in worldly terms, jockeying for position, status, power, and prestige. And Jesus responds to them and to us today by treat, teaching them a critical lesson. That true greatness in God's kingdom is not about being first or having authority. Instead, it comes through humility, being, being willing to be last and to serve others. Speaking of chicken and dumplings, I don't know if I'll be last in line because I really want to get some, Terry Lynn. So maybe the Lord's testing me. But we see this in, in the culture back then, and we see this in our culture today, that children primarily are looked down upon why because they're the ones who are not self-reliant they're the ones who are depending on others right think about babies right needing a mother's milk we think about children who are growing who need parents to keep them alive like they don't offer a lot of great value to society but Jesus would say otherwise he would say that the way of our thinking much like my mother in her last days that we need to we need to be more more child-minded we need to think like children we need to receive children because they're the ones who are actually dependent 
They're the ones who are actually reliant. And he was trying to teach them that in order to be first, you must be last. You must be reliant on God himself. And people who are at the head of the line don't need God's help. People who are the most prestigious, those who are, you know, affluent, though, like they don't typically need God's help. But humility is the path that God gives us to fight against self-reliance. When we humble ourselves, we recognize not only our need for God, but our need for others. It means putting others before ourselves and seeking to serve rather than to be served. This attitude naturally combats the pride that fuels self-dependence. The Bible teaches that God gives grace to the humble and he opposes the proud. How many of you guys want God's grace? You need to humble yourself, right? A prideful heart receives a stiff arm from God. Speaking of humbling and speaking of great humbling, we can look what happened last week, last weekend. Hurricane Helene, we've talked about it in the service. Great devastation. An unfathomable amount of loss. Homes, church buildings, jobs, roads, and most importantly, lives. So many people have lost everything, including their father, their son, their brother, their mother, their cousin, their nephew. People are in absolute devastation. However, the reports that we're hearing is that God is on the move. That as people are losing everything, they're realizing and they're asking themselves the questions, what do I have? What really matters? What if I would have died? God has humbled these people to the point where their hearts are fertile and receptive to the gospel. Many people who thought they had it all under control are realizing that they have no control at all. And they're trusting in the one who does. I want to encourage you guys that, that we don't need a great storm to come rolling through this town. We don't need travesty. We don't need devastation. Like God wants to humble our hearts today so that we'll rely upon him. That's how we fight against self-dependence, through humility, putting others first. So I want to challenge you to think in any area of your life where you, you prefer yourself more highly than others, where you show partiality to others, I want to encourage you to repent and humble yourself and receive the grace of God. Oftentimes it's difficult. I don't know about you, but I can be a pretty prideful dude. And my wife is really gracious and kind to let me know when I'm being prideful. And I thank God for her. My kids, they're truth tellers, right? They're not impressed by anything in me. You know what I mean? They're just like, hey, you did this wrong. Like, you need to stop. I'm like, you're right, thanks. And God has given us not only families, but he's given us a community called the church to walk alongside. And community and discipleship is how we grow together against self-dependence. Later on in Mark chapter 9, he says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. How do you know if you're off track? How do you know if you're being self-dependent? Like most people don't, hopefully, Christians speaking, most Christians aren't like proud about their pride, right? Most Christians aren't boasting in their self-dependence or their self-reliance, but it's oftentimes brothers and sisters in the church who will come alongside them and let them know when their devotion to God is not pure. When they'll, when they'll let them know that, hey, you're, you're being more sugar than you're being salt. Salt's called to preserve things, and sugar's called to make things sweet. We're called to be preservers of God's kingdom. We're called to be advancers of God's kingdom. And a lot of times, we, the church, we've lost our saltiness. We need people, we need people around us, right? Um, the Great Commission, you know, go therefore and make disciples teaching them to obey all that jesus has commanded how do you know if you're obeying the teachings of jesus if you don't have 
discipleship and community in your life. You don't. And so I just, I, again, I know some of you guys, and, and, and this, I know this is something that's drilled in here at this church, but it doesn't matter if you're part of a mega church or a home church or anywhere in between. Christians can hide. You, you can put the mask on, and you can be living a very self-dependent, self-reliant, prideful, arrogant life, but yet you can put on a show. And I'm just going to tell you that is, that's an abomination to God. That's not, that's not Christianity. That's not what the church is about. You need accountability. We all need it. Um, I don't want to go into all the failures of, you know, famous preachers and pastors who we've enjoyed and benefited from their teachings and their apologetics trainings and et cetera. But man, pastors and preachers, um, if you didn't know, they're falling they're being caught in, in immoral relationships, whether it be physical or online or whatever. And I look at these guys and I'm thinking, man, they either had no accountability or fake accountability, right? So I want to encourage everyone in here, find somebody or a small group of somebodies, right? Two to three people, three to five people, and make it a regular rhythm to meet with them at least every other week. And just get together over breakfast, over coffee, and ask hard questions. Hey, are you struggling with any sin? How can I be praying for you? You know, just evaluating where they are, where you are. And be honest, right? When you withhold the truth in those accountable, accountability groups, you're not really helping anyone. Don't fool yourself into thinking that, I got my own problems. They got their own problems. Like, they don't want to hear my problems. Everybody's got their own, you know. Don't fall into that. That's not what, that's not what Christianity is about. When you read through the scriptures, you see Jesus, like, he actually cared about his disciples as evidenced in this story. He cared what they were thinking. He corrected them when they were wrong. He affirmed them when they were right. He encouraged them when they needed it. And that's the pattern to help you fight against self-dependence is to trust God's people. You need encouragement. I don't know about you guys, but I get, I get pretty discouraged. Like, not only um, in my vocation, I stand outside abortion centers all across the country. Like, how did I end up here fighting against these evil? It's hard, man. But then I come home, and then I, I see the way I'm, you know, I see the evil in my heart and the way I treat my wife and children at times people close to me, I need people to encourage me, to affirm me, to blow wind in my sails, and so do you. That's what Jesus did for his disciples, and that's what we need. Last week, um, I went on a hiking trip. Anybody do any backpacking in here? Nobody? Adam? There's a reason not many people do it. <laughs> like, I've gained some weight since that last time I was at Southside. And um, for a lot of years, I made excuses, you know, um, why, I, why I'm in the shape I am. And they were pretty good excuses. But about a year ago, I just said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk. I can walk. Everybody can walk, right? Most people can. If you can't walk far, then walk a little bit, you know. But I said, hey, I'm still able to walk. So I started walking. Well, the evolution of walking has now turned into backpacking. And uh, some of y'all know Jade. Jade was here too. Jade's in great shape. So last weekend we went uh, hiking with him and another brother who's also in great shape. And they took me on the Appalachian Trail. And it was really hard. I mean, my watch will monitor my, my BPMs, my, my heart rate. And I was up like 160, like 170. Like it just kept, I couldn't get it down, man. It was like, so I had to keep stopping and just breathe. And the cool thing was my one friend was in front of me and, and Jade was behind me. And there was many times where I said, hey, I know I'm holding y'all back, man. Y'all just, y'all go ahead. I'll, I'll catch up with you. And they said, we're not going to leave you, man. We're in this together. Like we're in this together, man. We love you. Like 
We're not in a, this isn't a race. And whether it was their guidance, whether it was their encouragement, whether it was just knowing that they were there for me, I needed that. And I'll be honest with you, I wanted to give up. Did 10 miles, thing called Triple Crown, Dragon's Tooth, McAfee Knob. You can Google it later. It's beautiful stuff, but it's really hard. In the same way, being a Christian is, is also really difficult. Like we're fighting against the stream, right? Not to get too political, but like no political party represents us, right? Half the country's fighting with the other half. There may be one candidate that's more conservative, but like neither one is like Christian. Like neither, it's like we live in a tough world. Like we're citizens of another, of another kingdom, right? I'm not telling you not to vote. I'm not telling you who to vote for. What I'm saying is we live in a, a country that hates two, these two sides hate each other. And we're like in the middle somewhere, like saying Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. Both, people, both sides are going to hate you if you really stand on that. So what do we need to make it through? We need, we need brothers and sisters speaking life, wisdom, encouragement. Encourage you guys to do that. And then lastly, the way that you truly overcome self-dependence is you look to Christ. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us with, then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In your time of need, you can go to God. I know you know this stuff, right? But I'm telling you, you need to be reminded. The ultimate cure for self-dependence is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You never outgrow your need for the gospel. You never outgrow your need for God. Yes, upon the moment of professing faith in the Lord, you are justified. You are declared righteous. But the way that you become sanctified, you become more like Jesus, is in the storm, in the hike, in the trials of life, you continue to look on him. And as you continue to look on him, he will continue to make you look like him. Self-dependence really is the, the root pride, right? It's the, it's the very first sin, Adam and Eve, right? God gave them everything, his presence. He gave them his, his love. Everything was, was provided for them, except they couldn't eat from one thing, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they took it upon themselves to say, we'll do what we want to do. We'll trust in our wisdom or even the, the wisdom of the serpent instead of trusting in the Lord. But Jesus Christ lived perfect, died in our place, was risen from the grave. He chose dependence in God over anything. Jesus could have could have called down the angels of heaven to come rescue him in his fast. Jesus could have called down the angels of heaven to rescue him from the cross. But Jesus Christ fully trusted in God's plan, God the Father's plan for his life to the point of death. Showing, showing us that we too can trust in God no matter what. The gospel will be the answer. Looking to Christ will be the answer no matter any trial. In the end, Jesus Christ alone is worthy of our dependence. I want to read for you Psalm 33, 13 through 22 as we close. It says, The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds the king, he says, is not saved by his great army. The warrior, he says, is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may, be, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our souls wait for the Lord. He is our help and he is our shield. For our heart is glad in him. Because we trust in his holy name, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us as we ever hope in you. Church, let us not be like the disciples holding 
the blessing of God, yet forsaking the one who gave the blessing. Let us not grow weary in our patience. Let us not grow weary in our trusting. Let us not look to others to satisfy. Let us not look to politicians to make things right. Let us not look to our neighbors to be the ultimate source of hope, but let us look on Christ, the one who is able to meet us in all of our needs, to help us in all the ways that we need. Let us trust in him and let us not ever forget that. And if you're in here today and you, and you don't know the Lord or maybe you're struggling to believe on the Lord, I want to challenge you with this question I heard asked at a chapel in Salisbury about the hurricane. Like nobody in the mountains was expecting that. Nobody, none of us, there continues to be videos coming out of the raging water sweeping through valleys and villages and wiping towns off the map. Homes getting turned around 180. Nobody, nobody expected that. Just like nobody expects that this could be their last day. Many of those people were going about their, their business, doing work, thinking about their kids' baseball game at night, going to the store, make what's for dinner, and yet they woke up in eternity. And so the question is, where would you spend eternity if you died today? If you're in here today, all Christians should, should be able to know in their heart of hearts that they'll spend eternity with the Lord. And if you're in here today and you don't know the answer to that question, I want to encourage you, stop relying on yourself. Stop relying on the things of this world and start re relying and trusting in Christ. He is able to forgive no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you've experienced, Christ can forgive the Bible says anyone who turns to him, he would not put to shame. The Bible says anyone who confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord will be saved. And that's what you need. That's what everyone needs. That's the hope for the people in Western North Carolina. And that's the hope for us today. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your spirit would take the simple message, God, of reliance and trust in you and that you would Ingrain it deep in our hearts so that we might trust you more, Lord. I confess my own weakness. I confess my own pride. And corporately, we, we confess that we are a prideful people still. Those that have been redeemed, we have much area that needs to be worked on by you. And so reveal those things to us and help us, God, turn from our sin. Help us turn from our pride. Help us turn towards you. And yet, Lord, if there's one in here, Lord, who does not yet know you, I pray like that that tidal wave of water that came sweeping through the mountains, Lord, that your tidal wave of grace would come sweeping over their life today. And God, that you would bring them into the family of God. Lord, you are the hope of this world. You are the hope that we all need. You are the hope for today. You're the hope for tomorrow. Help us, God. Throw away all those things that we cling to which are worthless. And help us, Lord, ever the more cling to you the one who saves, the one who forgives, the one who gives hope in this life and the next. We love you and thank you. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.